we're recording this meeting and maybe get to go live to our Facebook page. All right, so. Well, good evening and welcome everyone to this virtual meeting tonight. I will call this meeting of Montgomery County School Board to order at seven o'clock on March 31st, 2020. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, of America. And, and to the republic, the republic which it serves. Which one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, next item will be adopting our agenda. May I have a motion to adopt our agenda as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we have an agenda. Next item will be approving our uh, bills or paying our bills. May I have a motion to approve the payment of bills as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. Any questions? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We pay our bills. The next item is our business part of the meeting and we have the presentation regarding the COVID-19 response. Dr. Meyer. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Karan. And um, we appreciate everyone uh, adapting to new ways. And, um, you know, that that's not only all of us, but you, you as well. Um, this is something new for all of us and it's the first time we are, we uh, have been going down this road, um, but uh, I am learning Zoom um, as we speak. Um, I, I've done several meetings already this week, and it's been a great tool for our schools. And um, so, but what we want to do tonight is just to give you an update. On you know, we've been updating you through almost daily emails um, and giving you all the information that's been given to teachers and, and, and whoever else that we send information to, but. You know, um, you, you all have not had a chance to actually answer questions um, or, or ask us questions so that we can answer questions. And uh, so what we want to do tonight is um, go through uh, uh, just a, a presentation with each one of our departments. Every department in our in our central office had a, a had a major role in making things happen. You know, we were um, you know, we were preparing about three weeks prior um, to being shut down. And um, with, with that being said, we had a plan. Um, we were feeding kids on Monday and educating kids by Wednesday. And um, that, that was pretty remarkable. Um, and and that's not, that has not been the case in all school divisions where this has happened by, by no means. But it took a, uh, it was a huge effort and a lot of organizing. And, and um, you know, we, we've, we've had things that have, uh, most things have gone really well. We have some things that haven't gone well. And um, so if you hit the first slide there, um, the, the number one thing is teamwork. Um, you know, I respond to a lot of emails um, that we have a great team and we definitely do. And, and the team, it involves every employee in the school division has, has done their part to do something to make this happen um, over the past couple of weeks here. And um, I can't thank everybody enough. Um, you know, our central office folks, have uh, done an extraordinary job putting the programs together and, and, and making sure it happens. And then, you know, out on the front lines are, you know, our nurses, aides, bus drivers, school administrators, um, you know, uh, have done a wonderful job uh, as well. Um, teachers have done an amazing job. Uh, teachers are, are, are learning new ways of uh, teaching um, and uh, just sort of being forced to and uh, have done a wonderful job in, in adjusting to this, this new time. So, uh, you know, what we did is we focused on the needs of our students, making sure first we were doing what our, what our you know, our, what our students needed. And the first thing we want to do is feed kids. And the, um, that is a huge need in our community. And um, Tommy will tell you more about that 
later on. Um, learning and adapting every day. That is uh, definitely uh, could be a theme <laughs> for what's been happening because, you know, what we found is um, some things worked that we thought would work, some didn't work. Um, and so what we've done is, is uh, we've had to change as we moved along. And, you know, what I found is people have been very understanding. Teachers have been understanding. Um, and um, our community has been understanding as we've had to make some tweaks uh, along the way. Um, you know, of course, one, one group that has been a major part of this is our IT department. Um, amazing what they've done and uh, how they've moved and, and changed things on their feet to make it work for kids too. Um, of course, there was a governor's stay at home order um, from uh, the governor's press conference yesterday. And the first thing that um, was being asked was, you know, who does this apply to? And um, it does not apply to um, our essential workers. Um, and so you, you all may get that question. Um, the, it is our, our food service delivery is, seen, is, is being seen as an essential, um, uh, essential service for our community. And um, our, our employees are allowed to continue to, to um, be out helping. Um, we, we're doing things to protect our employees. We'll talk more about that later as well. So we can still keep our cafeterias open to serve meals. Um, you know, as, as, as the schools are currently closed under the governor, um, you know, we have, um, under the governor's executive order, uh, they therefore should not be open for typical group um, meal service instead in support of social distancing divisions or distributing uh, non-congregate meals via grab and go. And so um, we're, we're doing a good job because we're actually have the, um, the buses running and um, we've got some great teams. We have some buses and aides on those buses who are loving what they're doing and serving our community. So just really excited about it. So let's get into the details of each uh, individual department and what they did to contribute to, um, to this massive um, undertaking. So we'll first start with um, uh, the, the individual who was the, you know, the leader from the get-go, from day one, the person I went to was Jason Gerritsen in student services. And he has uh, been a big part in communicating with all the um, key players in our community. So Jason, would you move forward with um, this, please? Yes, sir, thank you. And uh, again, just to echo what Dr. Meyer said, uh, it's been a real team effort from the very beginning. And I think it has helped us greatly uh, in our response that, that we did work together early on uh, as a team to bring all the departments to the table uh, as we began to, to really recognize what this situation was becoming. Um, just some highlights here on the slide. Our initial communication to families went out uh, late in February. Uh, that was also um, kind of wrapped in some of our usual communication around the flu season and talking about being smart and safe and washing your hands, staying home when you're ill. Uh, we did include um, the, the term coronavirus in that communication uh, back at the end of February, kind of as our beginning piece to, uh, to begin to address this. Uh, by March 5th, uh, we did have a COVID-19 response plan uh, written and in place. Um, this is a document, of course, that was, um, was new based upon the new illness. Uh, but very much based upon um, a lot of our other contingency plans uh, for other infectious diseases. Uh, that plan included five steps, um, an awareness uh, education stage, a preparedness prevention stage, a response stage, a stage that would include uh, suspension of operations with school, and finally a fifth stage that would discuss how we might return to normal operations if and when we close. Um, Around that same time, let's see if I've got a date here for you. Um, we were invited uh, March 11th to join the New River Valley Public Health Task Force. Uh, that has been a huge, um, a huge component of our response. Um, that involves local law enforcement, the health department, um, mental health organizations, basically all the key players. Uh, we meet on a daily basis. Um, communicate even over the weekend through Zoom um, to discuss kind of where we stand. And, and that has been such a key part uh, of, of our ability to, to be um, very much in the know in a timely fashion, work with those partners in real time and be in a position to respond 
quickly. Uh, along with that, through the whole thing, close collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education, Virginia Department of Health, and the Montgomery County Health Department. And of course, those folks along with us are following uh, the Center for Disease Control guidance um, because it, it, it very much is evolving as, as we learn about this illness and how to best um, fight against this illness. Uh, we stay in very close contact with that. Of course, you know, the governor ordered schools closed um, for at least two weeks on March 16th. Uh, the governor uh, has then, of course, come back on the 23rd and closed for the remainder of the school year, uh, the remainder of this academic year. We continue, Montgomery County Public Schools continues to provide for the needs of our students um, in very creative ways, both from the, the meal program to the instructional piece to the mental health supports. Um, I'm just very, very proud of the work we've done and, uh, and feel really, really blessed to be able to work uh, with a group of people who are doing so much to try to do the right things during a very demanding time. Um, it's, it's very uh, encouraging and exciting uh, to be able to know that we're coming to, to address this major problem um, in such a holistic um, and in just a very smart way. Thank you, Jason. All right, Thank Barbara. You. Good evening. Um, just to echo what Dr. Meyer said, it certainly has been just a tremendous amount of, of teamwork to, to move this work forward. And we're really tailoring our instruction to meet our students' needs. As you can see here, um, we've provided guidelines for continuity of instruction in pre-K through two. We've been mailing home packets, um, learning packets in grades three through five. We're using Google Classroom. Um, we're also using packets for grades three through five for those students who don't have internet access. Um, we've really focused on planning for those essential skills that will ensure that students are prepared to move on to the next grade level. We've provided realistic timelines for making new instruction available to students, um, providing it in smaller chunks so as not to overwhelm our students and our families um, and our teachers. We've provided guidelines for user-friendly lesson plans for our families and students that really communicate what we want our students to know and be able to do with simple steps um, to implement the learning activities. And I can say on a personal note, um, just the, the packet and the lesson plan that we've gotten as a family from my first grader, um, it's just so easy for us to be able to follow and it tells us exactly what to do step by step and, and what my son is supposed to learn in that lesson. So very much appreciate the work that our teachers are doing. We've reinforced the need for keeping it simple, recognizing that not all children have the same level of support at home and that remote learning and, and what our children, you know, what they're doing at home cannot look like what learning looks like at school. Um, and again, we've really focused on equity by providing access to the same essential skills for all students, um, whether they have internet access or not. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, uh, Carl. Carl. Barbara mentioned uh, many of the things that are on my list as well for secondary. Uh, that's not unexpected because Barbara and I work very closely together to make sure that we have consistency in pre-K through 12th grade. Um, I'd like to point out also that one of the challenges at secondary has been keeping it simple. Uh, we have very well-meaning teachers who are wanting to continue instruction at the highest level possible. And we got some uh, feedback from folks about uh, it being a little overwhelming for students. Although we got some feedback on the other side as well, that things were, um, it could be more rigorous. So we needed to find a happy medium. And we believe that over time we have found that now. Um, and the biggest things we're working on is uh, getting the teachers to understand that we want them to assess learning rather than focus on assigning grades. And uh, we will be providing them with direction and guidance on how to award final grades. We, uh, there's some guidelines in there already, but mostly we, uh, we're going to determine this through a survey of all teachers, as well as a committee to figure out uh, the specifics that we'll be 
uh, guiding our teachers on with respect to uh, quarter four grades and how those will calculate into final course grades and how those will uh, at the high school level factor into GPA calculations. And then most importantly, um, just remaining open to feedback and input from all stakeholders and adjusting our plans. Dr. Meyer said that early on, we've learned a lot. We, we tried things that worked and we tried things that didn't work. And uh, we've heard from parents and students and teachers um, and principals, really every, all the stakeholders have provided us with really very useful feedback and input. And we've been responsive to all of that. I've been very pleased and impressed with the feedback we're getting from the community. Uh, our, one of our biggest concerns was uh, seniors, but uh, Dr. Lane, the state superintendent, has provided us with uh, amazing flexibility to keep our on-track seniors um, uh, to graduate on time. Uh, there have been a lot of waivers for graduation requirements, uh, verified credit requirements, uh, and, and, and just he's been incredible to uh, get those waivers in place for us to allow all seniors to be held harmless and graduate on time. Uh, and then in grades six through 11, uh, those students who are taking high school credit courses, we are working through how to, uh, to establish a process for awarding verified credits. Uh, again, the VDOE has already given us the leeway to do this through a locally developed process. And we are moving forward with uh, input from teachers uh, on a survey for how to, uh, asking them how they think we should do this, but also uh, a committee of uh, all stakeholders, six through 12 will be involved in making that decision. Thank you, Carl. All right, um, next, uh, Tony, are you there? There you are. <laughs> Tony, you need to unmute. There we go. There you go. All right. To help prepare our schools um, and our teachers to work with students with disabilities during this un unprecedented time, uh, we, we provided two Zoom meeting trainings. Uh, one was for administrators, and that uh, training consisted of specially designed instruction, uh, compliance, um, and uh, documentation expectations. The next meeting was for special education teachers, related service personnel, and also those administrators who did not get to attend the first training. And this surrounded um, the, again, expectations around special design instruction, lesson plans, guidance for the IEP process, as well as documentation expectations for continuity of services for students with disabilities. Uh, so I do have, uh, we did provide four uh, different uh, links for clarity for those who were on the call for training. And the first one, uh, involved, and she's bringing it up now, documentation. So here's a documentation that we are using across the division for every special education teacher, and the documentation is our evidence of how we are providing the special design instruction and how, most importantly, how we are providing equity um, across the division for students with disabilities to have access to the general curriculum. Um, the documentation is very detailed. It involves uh, uh, the co accommodations, a listing of accommodations per the IEP, how those accommodations are provided. It also touches based on special design instruction and how um, were the students able to access the, uh, the general curriculum. Uh, of course, you know, special design instruction is individualized per student. Also, we're looking for uh, special ed teachers to focus on the IEP goals and also making sure that the instruction is engaging. So we do want the, uh, both gen ed and special ed teachers to collaborate in the development of the lesson plans and to embed these accommodations within the lessons. Also, we're looking, making sure that we are pro um, having progress monitoring. And so uh, again, that shows that how we are uh, making sure that students are meeting their, um, their goals. Uh, this again is, uh, it looks very different, it's very new. Uh, so we assure the um, special education teachers that uh, um, this progress monitoring again will, um, is part of our evidence as well. If you scroll further down uh, the, this document, you will see parent contact. All of our special education teachers are supposed to contact our parents and students once a week. 
and to fill this document out for every special education student. Um, and so this, again, the expectation is to have a date of the call, the method of communication. It could be either a phone conference or a Zoom virtual meeting, what you've talked about during that communication and who was contacted. Again, this is our record, our evidence of how we're keeping in touch with parents and we're asking parents, what can we do to help support uh, any, uh, any clarity on instructions of what we have sent home, um, any additional strategies that you would need. And so again, just thinking about parents and students um, in everyday life, because this is different for them as well as it is for us. The next link, if we close out of this one, this is our guidance document um, for the IEP process. Of course, you know, students who have IEPs, um, we've had to um, really focus in on how this will impact our students with disabilities as we um, continue to participate in this extended closure. So we provided a document, um, a step-by-step -step document, and um, the paragraph here just talks about the expectations of distance learning, and um, it also uh, covers the state and federal regulations in reference to you know, how we implement. Um, we give clarity on lesson planning, uh, parent-student communication, data collection, and the required documentation, um, as I just spoke about earlier. As we scroll further down on the document, we have some guided questions for students with, uh, for our, our um, special education teachers to make sure that they are asking them, themselves these questions as they develop the lesson plans in collaboration with gen ed teachers. We cover child study meetings, we cover IP meetings, and we cover um, initial review and transfers. We also, uh, parents may request a meeting in person, so we cover how would you go about addressing that with the parent. As we scroll further down the document, we touch base on, again, re-evaluations, as well as any new testing involved in any re-evaluation as well. We talk about um, how we can extend our meetings uh, because, of course, we are in a, a position where we cannot have face-to-face -face meetings with parents so we are uh, making sure that everyone is documenting and we are extending our meetings out to when we can come back and to when we're in fully functional uh, mode at the school division. This document also touches base on initial eligibilities as we scroll further down and also any testing involved in initial eligibilities, whether they're complete, if, they are, if the um, assessments are complete, we're asking our teachers to hold those meetings, but if the assessments are not complete, of course it's difficult because we cannot um, have access to the student. And so we're um, asking parents, can we extend um, the uh, meetings out to when we uh, are fully functional, when we return back um, after school closure. And this um, is a summary of that slide. Um, the presentation is mainly just brings all this together. It's a presentation to supplement and to bring clarity to um, these um, uh, other documents. And uh, the presentation mainly just uh, it covers um, what's expected. It touches base on um, the uh, child study process, um, eligibility, as I went over before. It touches based on compliance. It discusses special design instruction, lesson plans, uh, criteria for success. Um, and it covers an array of uh, information that we've pretty much touched based on already, but it does give uh, a little more clarity um, as you move through this document. And so um, if we close out of this, we uh, get to the bottom um, one, which is the, um, we move that, uh, we scroll there. It's the last one, it's a resource, uh, resource guide. And as Barbara, she, okay. There you go, I just saw it. Well, I'll start talking about the resource guide as she's pulling it up. The resource guide is virtually a one-stop shop. It's a, um, a guide of resources for our special education and gen ed teachers. Um, it is a resource, uh, many resources of best practices 
that can be used uh, for instruction for any student. Um, it is divided into several different topics. And um, as it's being pulled up, I can, yes, here it is, there you go. Um, so as we scroll down, we can see the very topic, you see a table of contents, um, and within the document itself, uh, you do see the varied uh, types of resources. You see resources for technology. You see, um, as we scroll further down, resources for special education, professional development, social stories and visuals, lesson planning, behavior, social emotional learning, special education, data collection and monitoring. We go further into uh, reading and we go next into math, writing, autism, virtual field trips. So again, as you can see, many resources for a uh, special ed teacher or a gen ed teacher to pull from as they help develop lessons for students um, you know, within our school division. So again, this is mainly a one-stop shop uh, based on best practices, nationwide best practices uh, for students. So with that said, this concludes my slide. And so we continue to provide instruction for our students with disabilities. Uh, and again, with the, uh, the focus on equity across the division. Thank you, Tony. Right. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And you know, this is one of the most important things that we're doing is providing equity. Um, it is one thing that's being stressed greatly by the state. Um, you know, when we first were told that this may be a possibility, um, that was the first one of the first things that was talked about. And so, um, you know, Tony and his crew have been working for several weeks on this plan and have done a good job at putting it together. So um, next, uh, Tommy, are you going to do transportation for us? Yes, sir. OK, go right. Thank you, sir. Um, so transportation has done an outstanding job. Uh, we're actually transporting meals to bus stops as we do during just like we do bringing students, picking students up for school and bringing them home today. Transportation is delivering over to delivering breakfast and lunch to over 5,000 students per day. Uh, we successfully implemented the delivery and the receipt of the Chromebooks. Um, we are now delivering library books um, and all of those have gone extremely well. While we're doing that, our maintenance fleet continues to service our buses and do everything we need to do to stay in compliance with the state regulations. Uh, in anticipation of the AB uh, schedules, uh, we've been able to take 90 bus run routes and consolidate those into 40 bus runs. And uh, we'll implement that the Tuesday after we get back from spring break. But we are extremely excited about that and uh, we're anxious to see how it's going to work. Next, we've got school nutrition. Um, we're averaging over 10,000 meals per day. Uh, we're averaging over 50,000 meals per week, and we're holding that number. Um, in the course of two weeks, we've served over 100,000 meals, and that's just reimbursable meals. That's what we've given to students. Um, our kitchen staff has done an outstanding job um, in difficult quarters to try to be properly distanced from a social standpoint. Um, and we've done everything utilizing the kitchen as well as the dining space. And, um, and I think we've done an excellent job to do that. Um, on Tuesday, April 7th, coming up, we're not only going to deliver the meal for Tuesday, which will be breakfast and lunch, but we also will be delivering a lunch for students that will cover Wednesday the 8th, Thursday the 9th, Friday the 10th, and Monday the 13th. So they'll actually get a meal for spring break. Um, and we're pretty happy and excited about doing that. Um, we continue to work on our menus uh, to find ways that we can continue to offer meals that students are gonna be excited about. At the same time, what we can do to conduct, to make ourselves more efficient um, and be able to fit within the AB schedule, but at the same time, just ensure that we can provide the meals as we start to see uh, people that may have to take a day here and a day off there that we become as efficient as we can and we're not missing a beat uh, from an operational standpoint. On the facilities and maintenance side, um, facilities have done an excellent job. They've assisted, they're at every school. 
um, and they've assisted in the loading of product from the cafeterias, from the kitchens, into the buses, and then in the afternoon, the buses return, taking the product off the buses and bringing it back to the schools. Um, through their efforts, because the big thing for us with food is temperature, um, we're able to save and reuse a lot of the product that we serve during the day that comes back. Um, so they, they need to be commended for what they're doing. Even the teams have started to find time in between when we load the buses and then the time that we unload the buses, we're actually getting things, you know, we're starting to cut ball fields, we're starting to maintain the grounds, and we continue to do the work orders that we have out there so that when the time comes, school will be ready uh, from a facility standpoint. Um, the custodial team um, has been great. Uh, we continue, they assist us in the loading and the unloading and doing different things with food because one of the challenges we have with the six sites is that we do not have enough cooler and freezer space. So we actually move product between all the schools every day. Um, as well as now we've got three refrigerated trucks on site. Um, we have to do that because the amount we serve with those 10,000 meals, we're serving 21,000 milks every day to our students. So there's a lot of product that's being moved, in, moved on a daily basis. Um, our custodians, we continue to work with purchasing to ensure that we have all the products necessary to keep our buildings clean and to address any challenges that are there. The products that we use in our cleaning have all been approved by the CDC. And that's something that we take great pride in and make sure that we stay uh, ahead of the game with what we're doing uh, to clean our buildings. The budget, um, is probably the one area that, uh, you know, there's a great story. The challenge with the budget going forward is going to be in the sales tax arena. Um, we collect what we'll report in the month of May is the sales taxes for the month of March. What, what we report in the month of June will be sales taxes that were collected in the month of April. Um, you can see that we've projected a decrease of about $750,000. Um, we have gone ahead and to be proactive, froze all of our expenses as of March 26. Um, our intent is, is, to, is to make certain that we have no problems, which I don't believe we will, but that we have no issues with our FY20 budget and that we're able to close things out um, the way we've always done as a district and not incur anything. The 21 budget, we continue to monitor. Um, the governor has until April 11th to make a decision if he's going to sign the budget or try to make changes to it and begin the legislative process. The legislature comes back by April 22nd and advises on what they may want to do. Um, at this point in time, all the resources that I have, no one's given me any indication of what may or may not happen. Um, so the best recommendation I can give to everybody is we're going to stay status quo with the budget we've done. And if we hear something, we'll adjust accordingly. But at this point in time, I, I've not heard anything that's going to change. Um, the Commonwealth with the federal stimulus has received $237.6 million. Um, we're not exactly certain what the rules will be and how those can be spent. Um, and we tentatively calculated we'll get about $1.5 million of those funds. Um, obviously, it'll be focused on the academic arena and uh, we'll continue to keep y'all abreast as we get more additional information. All right, thanks, Tommy. Thank yes, you, Tommy. Uh, Harvey? Okay, I first have to say we were in a very fortunate position going into this as far as technology, thanks to our Chromebook initiative and our uh, Google Classroom initiative. Still out of the gate, the ITRTs worked very hard to train teachers to switch to the new sort of instructional environment. Uh, so they spent the first several days working with teachers, doing Zoom sessions. Then we came to the first uh, hurdle, which was the uh, Chromebook loading. Most of what we've been trying to focus on is um, overcoming the digital divide. Where students have had internet, it's worked great. The kids are getting on their Chromebooks. They are getting on and doing their assignments in Google Classroom. But for the kids without internet in this county, we're really focused on two areas. It's either socioeconomic or they're in a rural area without internet. So the first, we started with the uh, 
bringing all the Chromebooks in on the buses and downloading the assignments from Classroom. That was a process that took two days of 10 people working constantly. Um, in addition to that, we had to establish a help desk. The help desk is um, a lot of times we're able to call, talk people through their problems when they call in, either that or they can email in and it really doesn't require any hands-on of the devices out there. Where we do need to put our hands on the devices, we first try to get the people to drop them off here in the curbside service in the op center where in most cases we can repair it while they wait. Um, otherwise, we ask them to either bring it to the school and drop it off there so that they can interface with the school staff and they can tell us exactly what's going on. Or our final one is to continue to use the buses for people to drop off devices and come in through that system. Um, additionally, we've worked with all the other departments to try to um, give them either remote desktop or VPN services so they can work remotely from home. That requires us to touch both the machine here and as well as the virtual machine on the other end. Um, we've switched for a variety of reasons from that initial Chromebook perspective to doing it on a jump drive and that's really where we're at today. Um, Today we spent um, the majority of the day preparing envelopes to mail them out to uh, the families. The schools have contacted all of their kids who that were on the list for um, not having internet as well as others that they saw were not going in and doing their assignments. So our list has actually grown for secondary students. Um, tomorrow is uh, D-Day 2, download day two for us as we'll try to use the thumb drives to uh, approach the perspective. Um, additionally, we've been configuring and sending out uh, MIFIs from our resources, trying to get the most bang for the buck. So we review the list, we go in and see what students have um, maybe multiple kids in the family. So if it's a family that has 10 students, they would get a Chromebook or a uh, MIFI first. Also, we, when we're looking at those assignments, we often have to send somebody out to the uh, location or at least in the neighborhood that they're at to make sure that they actually do have signal and that the MIFIs will work. Um, additionally, we've pursued other sources for those MIFIs. Our partners at Montgomery Floyd Library were uh, really nice and they gave us all their inventory because they are uh, that they're closed down. So we used the, our partnership with them to get more MIFIs into circulation. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you know, you, some, yeah, something else too that I'd like to um, mention is, you know, of course our ITRTs did a wonderful job training our teachers in, um, in getting things online. You know, of course our teachers had a lot of knowledge anyway, but there's still some things they had to learn. And then they also had to learn for the first time to truly um, deliver instruction um, beyond their classroom doors. And uh, what we've decided is uh, based on something that we require, we require teachers to get a minimum of 15 uh, PD hours a year. And so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna give all teachers 15 PD hours just for what the efforts that they have made to, um, to, 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 to learn and deliver this uh, system of professional, of, um, of, of instruction. And so they'll, they'll get that um, added towards their recertification. So um, just really excited about that. And uh, that's just with a, teach, a teacher's idea. And uh, I thought it was a wonderful idea. And because uh, they def, because teachers have definitely spent more than 15 hours learning and implementing this new, uh, new way of teaching. So anyway, Harvey, do you have anything else to say here? No, this is, I'm sorry, You're, Harvey's done. Uh, next, Danny. So we really have been in a support role uh, with other departments uh, within the division and like Dr. Meyer and the others said, it really has been a team effort. We've uh, coordinated with student services uh, requirements for employees who are worried about whether or not they have the virus. And we came up with exposure plus symptoms equals quarantine. And we've been working with those 
um, individuals that feel that they need to be quarantined and, and helping them through that process. Uh, we helped develop uh, work plans for some employees with ha that have compromised immune systems um, who are at a greater risk of developing uh, or contracting uh, COVID-19 if they were to be exposed. So we've, we've come up with some very uh, uh, unique plans for some of our employees. Uh, we worked with operations and transportation to assign uh, aides and volunteers onto our buses and schedule those folks. Um, and it was, uh, it was a huge task, but we've, we've got a system now where our principals are taking attendance of those individuals. So we know they're there working. We're uh, providing substitutes um, for some of the aides if they can't be there, if they need to take some time off for personal reasons, doctor's appointments, whatever that may be. Um, we realized that we needed to develop some standard operating procedures. So we worked with Jason and student services to develop uh, th those procedures um, for our employees who are delivering the meals and posted those on buses. So uh, everybody has the same thing. Everybody should be doing the same things on those buses. Uh, we do have quite a few right hip employees who are close to finishing um, their substituting for the year in order to, to uh, earn uh, their uh, 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 health insurance, and we've worked with them to provide opportunities for them to work, as well as uh, some substitutes in certain areas. Um, the biggest thing I think that we have done and that's taken so much of our time has been working with individual employees who um, have concerns about uh, contracting uh, COVID-19 and making sure that they feel safe and that they're in a good place. And uh, uh, working with them to, to get doctor's notes and other things that we need to help us uh, provide them uh, the supports that they need. So it's, it's truly been a, a HR team effort as well as working with other departments within the, the division. Thank you, Danny. Okay, next, um, you know, let me first say, uh, Ms. Drake has done an absolutely wonderful job in the communication that's gone out. And um, so I'll turn it over to her. Yeah. So, you know, this type of event is an event that affects every student in our school district and it affects every employee that works for us. And so the role of my job, of our communications, is to support all of the other departments that we have. So you've heard the level of detail that were in these plans. You've heard the amount of preparation that went into those plans in advance. And so my job is to support those departments and to really get those messages where they need to be um, to the right audiences at the right time. In, in this type of situation, we work on consistent and regular communication. We know that that builds trust with our audiences. We started with some of our preemptive messaging. Jason talked about it earlier, where we were sort of letting people know that we were getting ready and preparing, we told them you will hear from us at least once a week, at least once a week. And so our families knew they could rely on us for information, but they didn't have to look in other places. Um, they knew that we would contact them when there was something that they needed to know. Of course, once a week turns very quickly into every day. Um, and we're starting to back off of that now and communicate still when necessary, but maybe a little less frequently. We're using a single voice right now, and that's the MCPS voice. I know we joke a lot about the snowball. Um, but the single voice is MCPS. So sometimes those messages are coming from Dr. Meyer. They might come from him via video or sometimes via email. And sometimes those messages come from me as the voice on the phone. But the division and the school board office is the single source of information. It reduces confusion. It again builds trust with all of our stakeholders. And then our schools have the opportunity to take the information that we sent out and they can provide reinforcement for the things that are really specific to their building. So it gives them the knowledge that they need and then allows them to share it with their communities as necessary. You know, our messaging is really strategic based on the audience. We make sure that all of the audiences get the same pieces of information, but the level of detail might be different depending on which audience we're communicating with. And what we found is really arming all of our stakeholders with information has empowered them. They really feel like they know what is going on. We can watch them on social media channels answering questions from other people. And that's how we know that we've really been doing a good job keeping people informed. 
Um, how they get the information might be different. So we do use all of the channels that we have available to us. That includes school messenger, that's our phone and our email system. We can even text message employees. We use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email. Um, and so those are all of the channels that we have available, but depending on the message will depend on whether we use all of those channels or maybe just some of them. So when we first announced the closure, of course, we were also delaying the school day. We used absolutely every channel that we had available. But now that we're moving into more routine communication, sometimes we might just use one or two of those. Um, and all of our messages to families are put on our COVID-19 website so that anytime a family can go back and look through all of the messages that have gone to families, they're all in one spot. Um, so our goal uh, with communication is for people to feel informed because the other teams have already done the legwork of making sure that we're ready and we're prepared. And so the job of communication is to support that and to make sure that people have the information that they need uh, to know that that is what is happening. Thank you, Brenda. Are we ready to move on our um, all next right. item? <laughs> well, no, hold on. I would like to um, ask Annie to, uh, to finish up here, if she would, and talk about how our A-B days have um, actually, um, how, we're, how we're doing that, what that's looking like, the reasons we're doing it, and that kind of thing. Annie? Great. Hey, everybody. Um, we looked, uh, I guess it was middle of last week, we talked about the need to further um, provide some separation for our employees and really wanted to look at whether or not it was feasible to go to an AB schedule with the real goal being um, people not coming in contact with each other. You're on a team, you kind of stay on that team so that those individuals who are having to work, you know, um, in the building are able to be in contact with the same people each day and then go back home and that would help provide those individuals with a level of comfort and also we you know say someone did get to a place they weren't feeling well um, the people that they are in contact with you know um, it's it's less individuals so that provided us an opportunity to break our leadership team um, into two an a team and a b team go b team um, and then the other piece as well is for our other employees that would be able to rotate their days as well. As Tommy spoke about, that'll start after the spring break for those in the food service process um, so that they were able to get those routes and were able to communicate those to the families and get those pre-spring break meals out to them. That's a lot to deliver for that first day. Okay. Thanks, Annie. Um, what, what, questions do board members have about any of the processes that we put in place or in just anything? You have to unmute. Or, yeah. to... <laughs> Go ahead, board members. Anybody? I, I say, um, this is Mark. I've, I've got a question. Um, well, I, I wrote down several here while you guys were talking. So um, for Dr. Walker, I was wondering, uh, first of all, I mean, I, I appreciate um, all the efforts that everybody's been been doing, and, and I uh, share uh, Mr. Garrison's um, sentiment that that you know I, I am proud to be you know part of this organization and 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 proud of uh, you know how we have weathered these changes and uh, and adapted. So I don't I certainly don't want to um, uh, minimize any of the work, but but I do. Uh, with my questions, I, I do just wanted to get a little bit more information on, um, you know, the students with disabilities, Dr. Walker, you, you put a lot of, um, there was, there was a lot of stuff there and a lot of resources and I certainly appreciate it. It's fantastic. What's, you know, in talking with some people, I think on, you know, who either have kids with disabilities or, or teachers who have, who've dealt with it or whatever before, what's the level, you know, what, what's it like on the ground? What, you know, what's the level of struggle, if you will, because I, I know for a lot of those, you know, different, depending on, on the child, right. And depending on the disability, it can be, um, it can be significantly more challenging to do some of the learning um, online and, and with all these sudden changes and, and that kind of thing. So could you kind of talk to, to maybe some of the, challenges maybe that you're that you're seeing and 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 whether or not you know what what resources you might need in the future and and whatnot she's gonna unmute i think you're muted dr walker sorry 
the first major challenge is uh, how different this looks for us uh, and our students. The social distancing makes it very difficult to, um, to work with our students, to have them, have them in front of us, to work with them. Uh, and uh, we have very stu students with varied disabilities that we do um, uh, hands-on uh, you know, um, as we work with them. So we are, that's different you know, for us uh, first and foremost. Um, the, we try to push out the equipment that students are using as the same that we use within the school division. We are, uh, again, uh, trying to make sure that we are in line with students' IEPs, um, but the instruction is different. It, um, uh, make it, it's, it, it makes it, um, there is somewhat of a barrier there because we are trying to make sure that we are um, in line with our federal regulations and our uh, with our monitoring, uh, with our guidance. So we do have to have some changes with how we address uh, some of the goals. Uh, so that's why the documentation is so critical. And um, also uh, with our virtual meetings, um, we, we're having those meetings, IP meetings virtual. And so uh, again, uh, usually they are um, uh, more hands-on, uh, more around the table at the schools. Uh, so uh, those are some of the difficulties that we're having. Um, we're trying to push out with our students who are who are who have significant disabilities, um, and our private day students uh, who are a place of uh, you know uh, at uh, our private facilities. Um, there are some difficulties there as well, um, and uh, so but we're trying to uh, do due diligence to the IP goals uh, with the IPs as written. And uh, again, trying to push out as much service, service and as much resource as possible. Um, but uh, again, the social distancing, uh, is, it's making it extremely difficult. Um, and so that uh, first changes everything. Okay, thanks. I'll let somebody else jump in. Any other questions or comments, board members? I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, again, I'll just uh, uh, ditto Mark's remarks about all the hard work everybody's done. I've, been, I've gotten tons of uh, compliments from people about how how the communications and all the efforts everyone's put in. So I know how hard everybody's worked, and I even got to ride on a bus and see it all in action. So, but um, one question I do have, I guess maybe. Carl and Barbara and Mark would be the people to answer. Um, do we have an idea of when we're going to make a call on how grading is going to be done? Because I've had a few people have asked me and expressed some concerns about that. Carl? Yes, uh, the survey uh, results are due in by noon Friday. And then I will convene the committee probably Tuesday or Wednesday to take a look at those results and begin to build consensus around moving forward. I've looked at the results um, from the past two days. There are about 290, I think, results so far. And there are some pretty clear trends emerging. And I think it's going to be fairly easy to build consensus and get the word out to teachers. That's good. Now, who are we, who are we surveying again? So I have done a survey for all element, I'm sorry, for all secondary teachers. Uh, Dr. Wickham has done one for uh, all elementary folks. And then the committee is, it's actually a large committee. It's about 50 people. And it includes uh, <laughs> students, parents, teachers, uh, school leaders, um, including principals and central office staff some MCEA representation, and that is from elementary, middle, and high school. Excellent, okay, great, Excellent. thank you. And if I can add um, to what Carl was saying, I used a similar survey to Carl's, but elementary is a little bit different, of course, we're not concerned with GPA, but certainly how to handle grades for this fourth quarter and final grades for three through five. So I sent part of the same survey to all elementary teachers, and as Carl said, it's due back by <laughs> Friday so that we'll have all of that feedback for the committee. And Carl, could you give everyone a general idea of what the state is telling us in terms of um, uh, regular credits, verified credits, graduation, and those types of things? Uh, yes, the state has been 
very, very uh, flexible and accommodating in providing guidance on how to meet graduation requirements. Uh, basically, uh, a, a broad statement would be that any barrier that might keep a, a senior, an on-track senior from graduating uh, will be waived. And so if, there, if a senior needs any verified credits uh, that they've not yet had the opportunity, or maybe they've tried once or twice and haven't been able to earn, but now they don't have the opportunity to try again, they, all of those will be waived. Uh, if students are in the middle of courses that are specific courses that are required for graduation, uh, all of those will be waived as well. Um, for uh, what was it, what were some of the other questions there, Dr. Meyer? Um, credits and verified credits. How about how about uh, SOL tests for um, just in, any student that's not a senior? Right. So. Uh, I assume that you all understand that in, in high school, when you take a high school credit course, you when you pass the course, you earn a standard credit, but in order to get a verified credit, you must pass the accompanying EOC or end of course SOL test. Mm -hmm. uh, there are five courses that students have to uh, pass <clears throat> SOL test in. And um, if students are currently in any of those courses, they will all, uh, the SOL testing requirement will all be waived for those courses, um, even underclassmen, and uh, they will receive a verified credit determined by a local process. And we have uh, suggested a process to the secondary teachers and asked for them uh, to give us their feedback. And we have, at least for now, with the 290 folks in on the survey, have about a 98% agreement on what that process would look like. You know, something too that the state has, has talked about several times is that w they can't tell us what to do, but they're making strong recommendations. And one of the strong recommendations is that, that we um, average kids' grades for the first three quarters and that whatever's done, um, you know, online that it not count against them, that their grades not be lowered. However, the grade could go up because of it in this situation. And so, um, and that seems to be the general consensus that's coming back from our surveys right now too. So. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right. No, seems like it is fair. <laughs> so it mirrors, yeah. it mirrors what Virginia Tech and uh, New River community college are doing with dual enrolled classes and what Virginia Tech is doing with their courses. I would keep it a close eye on uh, how they've been proceeding. AP, Carl? Yeah, AP is uh, the college board has given uh, a great deal of flexibility. I was just reading about that this evening. Uh, and, and I know that uh, one of our lead AP teachers in the, in the county has sent this information out to teachers and I, I will affirm that uh, here in the next couple of days. Uh, they are providing all of their AP testing will be online and it will involve a lot of student choice in what they will answer, uh, what questions they will answer based on what content they were exposed to. Uh, it looks like a real common sense approach that the College Board is doing. They've also offered refunds to anyone who has prepaid and no longer feels uh, like they are prepared to take the exam. Uh, one other area that may interest you, um, CTE credentialing, um, a couple of areas that are affected. Carl, can you speak to those? I think so. I've paid close attention to that. Of course, uh, Mark Husband has been all over that. The, there were three courses, I believe, that were uh, the ones most concerned about. I know one was cosmetology and master barbering and the number of uh, hours that they need to have in order to uh, get their license. Um, I believe some of those hours have been waived, and but they are still able to uh, take the uh, the certification exam. And the I think the one group that uh, perhaps is is not um, going to be able to get their certification this year will be the nursing students or the CNA certified nursing assistant students. Mm -hmm. It looks like they're going to going to be uh, held back a little bit on uh, being able to get certified. There was another group, but I can't think of it off the top. Yeah, yeah I know the CNA, they, they were pulled from um, the uh, the nursing home because uh, mm -hmm. that's where they go to get their hours in. Mm -hmm. They were pulled earlier than anyone else. That's right. Too, uh, so. Mark Husband's just texting me and he says, yes, cosmetology can test, uh, but CNA is not able to test. Mm -hmm. They're not probably ready. 
Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. All right. Thanks. What other questions? Other, yeah. Any other questions, board members? So I would just like to echo and thank everyone for all the hard work. Uh, just hearing wonderful comments from our community. Um, you know, this is our, our first time having to experience anything like this. And folks uh, seem to be very understanding and still appreciative. I had one mother tell me um, that she had a day off that she was able to uh, get, the, get the meal with her son. And she explained in detail how he explained in detail to her so mom this is how it works you know <laughs> we stand here and then they we do this and we do that and it was just wonderful how our students are also adapting and um understanding social distancing in many cases better than that than the adults around here are so uh i just can't thank you all enough i know there's going to be still many more challenges to come and the um um I guess maybe the wear and tear is actually the word for this because things are changing almost on a daily basis as to what we're required or, or we can't do or can do. And I, I just thank you all so much for adapting. And uh, one person said, I wanna thank you all as board members, but I had to keep helping them understand, you know, the board is just here, but it's you guys, and all of our teachers and staff and administrators who are doing this work. And I just can't thank you enough. Thanks, Penny. We have a great team. Thank uh, you. I, I will tag, uh, tag Penny on that because I heard from many people and especially thanking the board part. I always said, and I will say again, you know, I. We can't take any credit. You know, we are here to support, but like Penny said, uh, you are the one we thank. And I, uh, I, I told that, you know, uh, they are making how I look, you know, good because I'm not doing anything and taking all the nice compliments. But I said all those uh, people, Dr. Meyer, the leadership, the teachers, principals, aides, bus drivers, um, custodians, cafeteria workers, I guess that's the... It takes a village comes, I think, in the picture very nicely in this situation, too. And definitely a great team and um, many, many compliments, whether from students or teachers or or just the community, community members, uh, knowing that we feed the kids, knowing that we gave uh, library books to kids, uh, knowing that, you know, the Chromebooks coming with buses. I mean, they are very, very impressed. So really, really thank you from the bottom of my heart. That's just, this is, has been tough, but I think we're gonna survive. We will. Well, one of the things I can say that I've been excited about hearing is community members that have gotten excited about seeing kids get excited when they see the school buses coming. Mm -hmm. I've heard lots of comments about, you know, the community members would say, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe how excited they got when they saw that bus, even if they weren't. Um, you know, a need of the lunch. It still shows how much kids enjoy a familiar face, school systems. Maybe they like to think they don't, but they really do love school. So I think that's been exciting for me is just knowing the community seeing that. Mm -hmm. I would just like to thank everyone as well. Um, you know, this is certainly some uncharted territory for all of us. And, you know, to hear that, teachers and principals are going out to some of our large mobile home parks and encouraging the students to, um, to, to get out and get their meals um, and, and just, you know, adapting for teachers to teaching from home is quite a challenge. Um, I know I taught, I mean, I worked from home for 12 years, so it, it, it's different. And, and on top of that, if you've got children, your own children, that you're helping do their own homework, as well as um, managing your your students um, is challenging. And I, I love the fact that some of our schools are going out in the neighborhoods and doing a car parade, um, helping this, you know, 
the students are seeing them and they're seeing the students. And I think that connection is, is very helpful um, because it, it can get hard because, you know, the students are what they do their jobs for. Um, and it can be hard if, you're, if they're not there. So I wanna also thank everyone. I'd like to thank everybody too. Um, it only took Jamie and I two hours, two and a half hours, Jamie, to do a 10 to 15 second video to thank everybody. So if you guys haven't had a chance to see that, let us know, we'd love to show it to you. Um, but seriously, in all seriousness, um, you guys rock. Um, I, I can't tell you how much good I've heard, how much good Hank has heard. Um, you you guys are amazing. I'm so proud to be a part of Montgomery County Public Schools. I'm so proud to be a part of this board. Um, you know, the thing that has really um, touched my heart pretty much is to see how much our students really love being in school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, not that they don't enjoy being off the first couple of days, but now, you know, I seem, I see that longing to, to have that connection again to the classroom and to their teachers and everything that the teachers and, and everybody else, the administration is doing to reach out and touch these families and these, and these kids is amazing. And the feedback that they're getting from this and uh, it's a terrible thing that we're having to do this. And I feel horrible for our seniors. I know that it's a really hard time for them as, as well as everybody, but I can't help but think that there's some learning here that is getting done in a different way that wouldn't be taught in school that's going to be life learning for them and um, the appreciation so I'm thinking maybe when we go back um, there's going to be a different a different way of looking at school and and how much it means to them now so um, I think that the appreciation there from both sides from the community from everybody I think it's just we're going to be much stronger when we come back not that we already aren't great but we're going to be we're going to be much stronger and I think our um, community and and everybody's just going to feel really good about our system you know I agree Dana 100 percent you know um, the, the learning that's occurred mm -hmm. for everyone is is tremendous and um, I, I think you know, we can use this opportunity to change education and what it looks like even. Mm -hmm. And it's forced everyone to think outside the box right. um, and um, be even more creative than, than, we, than we already are. And so, um, you know, I can see a lot of, uh, you know, long lasting impacts from what we've had to do, uh, both as teachers from the classroom and how they view um, education to um, parents, to um, us as um, administrators as well. So, yep, good points. Thank you. So <laughs> let me just uh, piggyback you, Mark, on that. During our strategic planning, the question was asked for us to, you know, think about what education would be looking like, you know, in decades to come. Mm -hmm. And we're getting a real live education <laughs> about Absolutely. how... Yeah how things may possibly work better or work in a different way to help service our students and make sure that they're getting what they need. Yep, agree. I, I was, I was gonna mention that, um, and I think I said this, I believe it was to Annie, wasn't it to you, Annie? I, I told you that that Apollo 13 movie quote came to mind um, when all this kind of went down and that, that one scene in Mission Control where where somebody's saying to somebody else that this is, you know, this is the worst time ever for NASA and Gene Kranz turns around and says, with all due respect, gentlemen, I think this is going to be our finest hour. Right. And, and that, that kind of came to mind that, that, yeah, I mean, this is a challenge, but, but the fact that we were able to step up to it, I think is amazing. And I do think the board uh, to some degree, I mean, obviously the, the staff deserves most of the, the credit, but it's important, I think, to know that the board also deserves some credit for a decision that we made four years ago at a retreat that I was at where we, uh, and, you know, I was new on the board, and, and I think Dr. Meyer was new, and we talked about what we, where we wanted to go, and, um, and we agreed as a board that we wanted to invest in, uh, in technology, and, and that there was kind of, that was kind of a big investment. It was, um, you know, I think there was at least a little bit of blowback on that. And I think the lesson for us and all of this, as Penny was saying, is to, you know, to, to keep 
you know, let that be a reminder for us to, to keep kind of that culture of innovation and to, to keep our progressiveness on, on, on how we uh, uh, move forward. I, I mentioned to Mark, we, we had a one-on-one -on -one in the middle of all of this. And, and, and I said, I mean, we, we may have to do this, but even if we don't, um, that, you know, we should maintain what we're learning about this distance learning and online learning and, and, and incorporate it into our, um, you know, into our learning on a yearly basis, at least, if not more frequently and, and, you know, make that part of what we do. So something else that Mark said during our meeting that stuck with me was, um, he said, Hey, if, if, if we ever have to stop feeding the kids and, and the, delivering the lunches, which we hope we don't, obviously, can we at least still drive the buses through the neighborhoods? Cause kids just like seeing the buses <laughs> and wave out the window. I've, I've had parents tell me that that's, that's the highlight of the kids day. Um, I, I, I that's, heard that too. Yeah. That's, it, well, and another for that normalcy, right? They're, they're looking for that. Right. Normalcy. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. No, it's, it's okay. I was just going to say, you know, another view to the, even though I think the Chromebooks and the technology we have is fabulous. I also think this is going to show everybody how important, important teachers are to students because a lot of the parents that have to do the work are getting a real uh, look at what teachers do every day and how they get kids to cooperate and and do their work together and and sit and you know listen and I, I've heard a lot of that kind of stuff too and and you know sometimes we have to open people's eyes that way so I think it's another way to look at it too because I know even with Abby and, and New River and having some classes that she's really had to struggle with being online and not having that one-on-one -on -one to help her through those problems being online is a great alternative but it you can't you can't always uh, beat that one one with one teacher student you know situation. So a lot of community members and parents are really seeing how important teachers and and all staff are in, in the schools to making a student's day mm. possible. I, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I've heard of several parents who have already suspended their kids, and so yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Home, homeschooling not going very well. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, that's a great point too, Jamie. Thank you. So I have um, another question, um, if we could get back to that. Um, and this is mainly uh, aimed at Tommy, I think maybe. Um, but Tommy, I want to talk a little bit about the budgets. Um, I heard what you said. Um, so a couple questions that come to mind. You said something about freezing all expenses. I mean, obviously, can, can you elaborate on what that means exactly? Because obviously we're still, you know, we still have personnel. We're still paying people that way. We still have we're other paying. bills that I'm sure we have to pay, right? We're paying our operating expenses. Freezing expenses would be, uh, you know, if I if you haven't ordered something yet for, F, for use in FY20, the chances of us receiving it is going to be pretty slim. So a lot of times those are the dollars that, you know, from a purchase order standpoint, you carry it over into FY21. The intent of freezing it is if we haven't spent it to date or made the order to date, we probably don't need it in FY20. So you'd look at it as an FY21 expenditure. Create as much dollars as possible in the FY20 budget to do two things. One, to ensure the budget's all completely balanced and we can properly report everything. And we're not having to make transfers at the end of the year. And number two, take the dollars and, and working with the county, restrict those funds so that they're available for the superintendent and the school board for whatever challenges may be presenting with the FY21 budget. So yeah, so that's a good lead and then into, into that. And I, and I appreciate that we're doing that. And um, that is something, I mean, I. I guess maybe tend to be a little bit fiscally conservative on this stuff, but I'm certainly worried. Um, I hope that I'm just being a little bit, um, you know, reactionary on this, but, um, you know, I guess I, I was under the impression that the money that we were going to get from the state is kind of spoken for, for 1920, right? I, I guess I didn't realize before that, that although that's mainly the case, that, that the, the sales tax dollars are actually, somewhat variable i guess over over time in the past those those dollars have been pretty predictable and so we kind of treat them as a fixed 
income stream, but they're really, we're finding out now that they're really not, correct? Right? They are variable in that the, the sales tax is based off of the whole entire state. It's not dollar for dollar just within Montgomery County. Um, when you looked at the two thousand, if you go back and look in 2008, when everything went down, one of the biggest hits was in the sales tax arena. And that obviously I think is going to be potentially our biggest hit in the FY20 budget, but it's one that I, I'm very confident that we can get through. I think the 20 budget is fine. And we may have, you know, some tight things, but I think at the end of the day, it'll be fine. 21 is the great unknown right now. Um, you know, other counties in the state are taking actions. Um, I'm in constant co communication with the county. Um, and right now, there's just no information to say which way this is all going to go. Um, so, you know, so I what believe, kind of action? Huh? So, what kind of action are other counties taking, and what kind of action? I mean, could we do? I mean, you've already frozen all ex expenses. I mean, is there anything else that we could even do? I would. Um, I would not recommend it. Worst case? I would not recommend it at this time because I feel like um, if you get too far ahead of this, you may make a bad decision with little information. I think you're better off seeing what the financial impact's gonna be. Um, so so with that it, in mind, can you, I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, this situation economically is totally different than what 2008 was. Um, and so, you know, there's a chance that when this resolves itself and people get back out in the marketplace um, and, you know, things are going to take some time to take off, but it's going to come back a lot sooner than what happened with 2008. Okay. The other thing about it is, is you've got at the state level, their fund balance, they do have a reserve. Um, so, you know, there's things they can do that we as a school system can't do. Um, so I think there's tools that both the state and the county have in their toolbox that you as a school board do not have. And it's best to see how all those tools are gonna to be used. And that's why I think the best course of action right now is to sit tight and just let's, let's get better information. Mm. Now I've been so talking, let me say, I've been talking to Mr. Meadows and um, you know, at this point, uh, he seems to think they're gonna move forward um, as planned. Um, you know, probably um, something that he, he talked about was how much most of our revenue is dealt on, re on real estate taxes as opposed to um, sales taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the two, this is a time when the two towns, um, which to sometimes them. are a disadvantage to us because they do not contribute to public education. Um, they, they're live, they pretty much live off of sales tax. Um, a lot of other localities like Roanoke County, there are no towns in that, in that, in, in Roanoke County. So therefore they do depend on the sales tax where we do not depend on that sales tax as much um, as, uh, as the towns do, if that makes some sense. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Craig, um, seems to indicate at this point that, um, they're, they're, they think they'll move forward, um, as planned. Um, I believe the general assembly is getting back together here in the in the coming weeks mm -hmm. and we should know something by, um, when Tommy, uh, by the end of April, um, yeah, this is 22nd. Yes, sir. 20 seconds when the legislature make their decision. Okay. And I'm hearing too, they want to protect public education, which, yes, sir. Is, um, which is something that um, was not a priority in 2008 too. That was another difference in 2008 compared to now. 2008, uh, public education was not a priority in being protected. Um, and now um, the, the legislature is saying that it is. So we'll see, uh, you know, once, once it's all said and done. So. What is the, uh, do we have a different timetable because of that? Um, can you talk about the time frame on, on knowing? Go ahead, Tommy. The county, by statute, the county is required to adopt the school budget on or before May 15th. My understanding talking to the county is that they intend to still consider the vote at their April 13th meeting. Mm -hmm. That's only a couple weeks away. Yes, I'm sir. sorry. So, yeah, say that again. So they're they're considering what by April? They're, they're staying on their schedule, which was the vote on the budget April 13th, at their meeting on the 13th. 
what if so what if things change from so, so mark you, i hear you about the real estate versus the uh, state sales tax but what worries me is the state side of things and, and the oh, articles yeah. i've been I, we're probably reading the same articles but i'm coming away with the fact that things could change i think there's mm -hmm. a lot there's a lot of push i think and a lot of pressure from certain places on the governor to protect public education, but there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. So mm -hmm. I guess the question becomes, what happens if things change from the state side? Can well, we go back and, and, and. I mean, if things um, change then, yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a pretty simple answer. If, if things change and we don't get as much money, we got to change our budget. And that's where we start um, looking at raises. Uh, we look at benefits, we look at positions and, and um, I mean, it's, it would all have to be looked at as we move forward. And, and yeah, first thing that probably would be hit would be raises. That's where most of our money is, is, is in the raises. Now, something else too that Tommy um, hit on briefly that may help us too um, is the money from the federal government and the stimulus, right. uh, which is possibly up to a million and a half. That may help us out tremendously. Um, usually it's not recommended, you know, back when the stimulus was passed in uh, it was 2009, right? Yes, sir. Uh, um, the, it was not recommended that that money be spent on one-time positions, for instance. Okay. Or one-time, in fact, it was recommended that it was spent on one-time items and not placed in your regular operating budget. Right. This time it may be a little different where it would be okay to place it in your operating budget because um, of the likelihood that the economy will, will recover quickly back to where it was, where that was not the case in 2009. We were looking for, at several years out before we were going to see the economy um, rebound, if that makes some sense. So we would be more flexible in the use of that additional money coming from the federal government, which could definitely help us. And, and from what I've seen so far, um, there will be, um, unlike in, even 2009, they're opening it up to for it to be spent on a lot of different things. Right. And, and one more thing too that the time and I've talked about is, you know, we may end up with a significant, we hope with a significant carryover for this year that then we can use an operating budget next year. Um, you know, what we were going to do here at the end of the year is, is for instance, buy buses. Okay. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to spend possibly what, $600,000, Tommy, on yes, buses? Sir. Yes, sir. We're holding yes, sir. off for that for now just to see how things are looking. Same for $600,000 in Chromebooks. I mean, that's one, $1.2 million right there that we're going to hold off on just to see. And if we might have to take it into the next year to use it for operating expenses. So when we go back to the Board of Supervisors and we have a a large amount of carryover, which is very possible this year, we're, we'll explain to them it's because we stopped purchasing things at the end of the year that we usually purchase. And, um, and, and, and letting them know that, you know, basically we're, we want to sort of keep this as a reserve. So we're, I think we're in a good place um, as a county moving forward, but you're right, we're gonna see what the state says. Great, thank you guys. I appreciate you being on top of it. and and thinking a couple steps ahead. Any other questions, comments, board members, before we move on to the next item? Next right, item is the supplemental look, appropriation. Yeah. Yes. And so this is supplemental appropriation that is based on what we receive from our um, after before and after school programs. And we're asking for um, approval tonight mm -hmm. for this. Okay. Yes. May I have a motion to authorize a request to the Board of Supervisors for a supplemental appropriation 2019-2020 uh, school operating budget in the total amount of $400,000. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> I have a double motion and double second, I think. I appreciate that. Any questions? 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We approve the appropriation. Next item is our unfinished business board members. Do you have any unfinished business you would like to introduce? I guess um, I don't, I, I hope this is the appropriate place to bring it up, but uh, do we have a latest update from the state on our meetings and our meetings electronically? I mean, now that the governor has instituted stay at home through June 10th, I'm assuming they're going to allow us to take care of some other business meetings, or is that something that's still being discussed? Uh, Brenda, I'm going to let Brenda um, take that one. So the, the attorney general submitted an opinion. Um, we've gotten the emails from BSBA. Really nothing has changed for you as a board when it comes to meeting. If you want to meet solely electronically, you may do so for three or for two reasons. The first is to discuss the state of the emergencies, right? So that's what we're doing tonight. We're talking about the district's response to COVID-19. The only other things that you can meet about are things that would potentially harm the public if they were not enacted. So that would be things like your budget. We do have plans to move forward with the budget public hearing electronically, if that's what you wanna do. Um, but we really are pretty limited if you want to meet solely electronically. Of course, there are other options where you bring four board members in um, and they provide the physical presence and then three remote in, but you also have policies on the number of times that a single board member may electronically participate in a meeting. Is, is that latter, policy that's that's a policy for our board is that correct or is that a state i believe it's state code but i'd be happy to look into that for you and provide further yeah because if it's i mean if it limits the board and then, then yeah. that's, that's something that's a change, state right that's state code yeah is that okay all right i think so yeah well i guess maybe then the other question to either to mark or, or to the rest of the board is can we can we keep doing this through the end of the year is there other stuff that the end of the school year. I mean, is there are there other topics that that, that need to come up um, that we need to meet physically? For? Well, you know, uh, of course, the good thing is the, the the most pressing thing during this time of year is the budget, and so um, you know that's that will be a reason to meet to meet every time. Did y'all hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Anyone else want to chime in? Does that make sense? And we may very well in the in the weeks ahead, we may get different directions too. I, I mean, I don't know. Again, everybody, um, you know, goes and changes things as we go along. So I'm hoping maybe there will be a different direction that we can discuss other things or we can let public to participate in some other forms and shapes. But right now, I think good plan is to follow what the Board of Supervisors following if we have to in terms of the public hearing on budget and um, right. and to keep keep things still emergency related, I think. Yeah, we'll still have a pu public hearing on the budget and, and the um, board supervisors handled that obviously in a different way where folks actually wrote in, I believe, to um, express their thoughts mm -hmm. on the budget and that was their public input. Yeah, they gave a couple, uh, couple options, I think, to the public uh, to be able to send in their thoughts and then um, we may have to look at it for hours. Okay. So I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. So um, is it possible to have four of the board members you know, physically in one spot and then have the other three in uh, close proximity in the building, but remote in and not have that count as an electronic uh, participation? So if you're not all in the same spot, then that's remote participation. If they have to use an electronic device to participate in the meeting, it would be electronic participation in the meeting. We can certainly ask uh, the attorney for more clarification and guidance. 
Well, my thoughts, the, the rooms are large enough. You could be six foot apart and all of us be in the same room. Right. I mean, basically. 10, 10 people. Okay. Well, the, I mean, the big conference room is, is large enough. Plus also the main room that we use is large enough as well. I mean, we wouldn't maybe all have to sit at the dais, but, or would be able to, but throughout the first couple rows, I would think you could be all in the same room, just six and still be six foot apart, even for 10 of us. You know, probably if, if we want to do that, the probably best place to do that would be here in this room where I am right now at the operations center. Um, or we could spread out, you know, here easily. The question would be the um, public and where would they um, have the opportunity to be? Um, that would be, that would be challenging. Um, Brenda, got any thoughts on that? I, I'd have to go back and look at the guidance to be sure, but I really think the limitation on a meeting is about the board members being in the same place. I think that we could do what we're doing tonight. Um, and as long as we provide adequate notice to the public and make sure that people have the opportunity. We had over 100 people viewing tonight's meeting at various points, um, which is more than we see in the boardroom a lot. So I think that that's a great tool. And then we could have a room on site potentially for anyone who wanted to come in person. And then again, modeling the Board of Supervisors methods for submitting public comment or public address. Um, in advance of the meeting. I think as long as all the board members get in the same place, we've got some room there. So could we, um, could we, we think, Brenda, we could be in here. We could actually, could we set up a room around here that actually videos into here? However, well, let me just think about that. Seven board members, myself and you, eight, nine, and a speaker, a speaker could actually come in at their turn and actually speak. If need be, that's true. Is that making sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. that, yes. That would be ten people, yeah. right? we will be under ten, yeah. Um, and you know, we could video it out to the hallways, you know, as to what's going on. But if somebody could actually come and get public input in mm -hmm. this room, and we could still have um, plenty of space for social distancing in this room. Um, so that might be something that can that can work. And I don't expect I like that we're going to see large crowds. I don't expect that we're going to see large crowds. Uh, Mark, are you talking? Anyway. Yeah. Mark, talking. Mark, meet them. Is he talking? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I was just. I, I don't know if you heard me the first time. I. I said it, that. Um, Seems like Dr. Myers, you went you okay. went silent there. For, uh, That's me now. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was just I was just saying that I I don't expect that we'll see you know a large uh, a large crowd from the public, but I think it'll you know for for legal and other reasons uh, you know we can still give that opportunity. I just I, I think it's important that we be able to figure out how to conduct the business, how to have discussion um, and not just be limited like we are with this uh, situation. Yeah. To be able to be together to do that. So is my idea worth trying, you think, Brenda? I like it. I, I, think, I think it would be a good idea to do that. I think there's still things going on that we need to discuss that are, and it would be good to have that forum. Okay. I, so, I don't know that we need to do it every time though. Do, do you guys feel like we need to do it at every meeting that was regularly scheduled between now and the end of the school year? Well, we have one in April anyways. Um, and yeah, then how many are left? two in May. And then it comes to a decision to how to do the retreat and Dr. Meyer's evaluation. And uh, I think one more meeting in June. So we are talking about three, 
four, five, six, I think, opportunities till end of June. I'm up for trying it um, this next meeting, if y'all like. Um, doing it here, um, you know, having folks out in the hallway who, who do want to speak, make sure we're spreading them out. And then individuals can come in one at a time and speak to the uh, speak to the board, and we could even video it possibly and close circuit it out out yeah. to the hallway. I'm I'm completely good with that, but how yeah. is that going to work with this home lockdown thing? Not so much for us, but for anybody coming out to the meetings. It's, Supposedly, that's not considered a. Actually, I think that we would be exempt because it's an educational. Um, the the go governor wrote in the executive order that um, if it's for educational purposes, folks are allowed to be out. Okay. I think there's a. I think there's an exemption for government actually. So. I think well, I, I didn't. I wasn't I meaning did, us. I was meaning the public. Yeah, I understand coming out. So yeah. So the public I mean, excuse to come out to speak to us. You think? What's that, Gannon? The public, you know, we, we can go and meet because it is essential and we are the government, you know, government, um, but the public individuals, are right. they going to be allowed to come out and speak? I believe so. The way the executive order is written, it's going to allow that, any travel to a school. Okay. All right. That was what, Jamie, uh, you were saying, all right? Right, right. I think that's the whole point of the thing is to encourage people to stay at home. You know, I understand we've got business to tend to and to do, but you know, it's just a thought. Okay, so I, my, I would so my maybe... point was that we be able to be together to not be so limited in our discussion. Yeah, I agree. And I agree on that too. Since this is now going all the way to June, I don't. I don't think we can get by without talking anything else. Bad yeah. budget. <laughs> so, so like I mean, I guess I'll make the suggestion to the leadership team, maybe to you know, may, maybe we still have some time to to figure this out. So, so maybe between um, you, Ms. Karan, and Ms. Graham, and and Dr. Meyer can 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 discuss this, but. I, I agree with with Dr. Meyer's suggestion that that we can use the operations center when we have a meeting that that might need to have some you know some, some public input or that kind of a thing. And if we have a meeting where you set up the agenda so that we're really only talking about things that are related to this emergency and to the budget and, and some of the other exempt things, then then maybe we can continue to have this this kind of a meeting. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think it has to be either or. We could probably switch back and forth maybe. Um, I think so. so. Depending on needs, yeah. Yeah. So just uh, based on what we need to talk about, how's that? Sounds yeah. good. Sounds good. Okay. I am moving on new business. Any new business board members? Hearing none, how about announcements and information? There's not much to, to announce and inform, I think, since we are stuck in the house, <laughs> not attending too many events to announce. <laughs> and the next one is uh, agenda preparation. And you see the next meeting will be on April 21st. And if you don't have any other um, questions or comments, uh, we'll be ready to get into closed session. Anything else before I get into closed session? Then our next order of business is closed session. May I have a motion to go into closed session to discuss one personnel matter and one student matter as authorized by section 2.2-2. 3711 of Code of Virginia. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we are in closed session. You're muted, Mark.
All right, so bye everyone. Um, thanks for watching if you're on Facebook.